there comes a time in the ministry of every minister of the gospel when you begin to realize that things are going to end, that things are not going to continue the way they've always been. And that becomes a time of reckoning. Now, there are some people who, when that time comes, are very joyful, especially pastors. There are some who are very glad to be relieved of all the burdens of ministry and all the obligations and responsibilities. And they look forward to a retirement in comfort, especially if they have a pension plan and Social Security and Medicare and all those good things to uh, surround them and make them comfortable. And so they look forward to it with eagerness. But there are others who have a different way of dealing with it. It's much more difficult. And that's exactly what we hear in the gospel lesson today. When Jesus is dealing with the expectation that his ministry is going to come to an end. Not a joyful retirement. Not a pleasant uh, house by the seaside. Not some kind of... Uh, environment where he can relax and relate and so on. But he knows that an end is coming. And so he has a sense of urgency, a sense of uh, commitment to his disciples. He wants to see the work that he has begun continue. And so he's going to do everything he can in those remaining days and weeks of his ministry to teach his disciples and to get across to them what this kingdom of God is really all about. You recall last week how Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, that place where uh, they were surrounded with all the shrines of the Roman pantheon and even a temple to Caesar. And there in that uh, highly pagan, heathen environment, Jesus asked them two questions. Who do people say that I am? And then, who do you say that I am? And it was there, of course, that we see Peter responding to Jesus' question, especially the second one. Uh, I visualize him standing up and saying, you are the Messiah. Now, in Mark's Gospel, that's all that we have recorded. Matthew has a little bit more than that. But at the very heart of what Peter is saying to Jesus is, you are the anointed one of God. You are the one that God has sent into the world to liberate Israel from all the oppressors that have uh, taken advantage of this nation. And you're going to restore greatness to Israel. You are the king, the promised one of God. And Jesus immediately tells him to be silent. He did not tell anyone. And he goes on from there to say some very shocking things. For he says to the disciples, look, the Son of Man is going to be rejected by the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, and he's going to be killed. And on the third day he'll rise again. And Peter, of course, reacts to that. He doesn't want to see that sort of thing happen. But Jesus says, no. Get behind me, Satan. Don't stand in my way because I have to finish this journey for which I come into the world. Well, today, we see a sequel to that kind of uh, uh, experience that Jesus had at Caesarea Philippi. And again, Jesus begins to teach his disciples. He goes uh, with them from Caesarea Philippi, from the place where <clears throat> on the Mount of Transfiguration, he's been transfigured before Peter, James, and John. And he comes down the mountain and regains uh, uh, the disciples who were waiting there and takes them to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was a city or the town where Jesus had started out his Galilean ministry. But going to Capernaum this time, he was not going there in order to uh, return to that kind of ministry. For in his mind, that ministry had come to an end. From now on, he needed to teach his disciples. He needed to prepare them for what it would be like after he was no longer with them physically. And so that's what he did. 
And that's why he said to them again for a second time, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and be killed. And after he is killed, three days later, he will rise again. Well, you can understand why the disciples uh, couldn't understand what Jesus was really trying to teach them. They were very much like people even today who when they think about being a Christian think that, oh, because I'm a Christian, I'm going to receive all kinds of special blessings and benefits and rewards. Uh, I have my ticket to heaven. I'm going to uh, uh, be on the, on the receiving side of all kinds of blessings and so on and so forth. And they expect that uh, things are going to get better and better and better for them throughout their lives now because they follow Jesus. Not realizing what Jesus himself went through and what Jesus said his followers would have to go through as well. The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men and be killed. And after three days, he will rise again. They didn't understand, and we have a hard time understanding that as well. But Jesus wanted to make it clear to his disciples, because when it happened, they needed to be ready. And then he went on to say, look, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, it's not going to be by how much fame or popularity you gain. It's not going to be because you are elected to some particular office. It's not because you are wealthy or uh, powerful or prestigious. If you want to really be great in the kingdom of God, you have to be a servant of all. You have to be ready to humble yourself and to give of yourself for the sake of the kingdom of God. And then to make the point exceedingly clear, there was a child in that room with them in, uh, at the house in Capernaum. And so he brings the child over and he embraces the child, something which, of course, these days uh, is uh, frowned upon in society for a stranger to touch somebody else's child. But uh, Jesus welcomes this child. And then he says to his disciples, whoever welcomes one of these welcomes me. Jesus is doing something that is revolutionary in nature. We don't recognize it because we live in a culture that, that uh, places uh, a certain amount of gives a certain amount of attention to children. Um, and, uh, you know, glorifies children in many ways. But in Jesus' day, that wasn't the case. Uh, in Jesus' day, the mortality rate was very high amongst children. Many did never ever grow to adulthood. And uh, they were often treated as being uh, just necessary, but not really important. And so they were treated without much respect by people in those days. And Jesus says, look, we need to be the kind of people who welcome the least, the lowest, the least powerful, the weakest, the neediest, the ones in our society who are in most need of love, compassion, and care. Whoever welcomes one of the least of these welcomes me, Jesus said. And if you welcome me, you're welcoming the one who sent me. Think about that for a moment. And Jesus is saying to us, if you want to see God, if you want to know God, if you want to experience God, you'll experience God by extending your arms in welcome to the stranger, <coughs> to the lowly, to the weak, to the less fortunate, to the ones who are on the margins of society by reaching out to them, by caring for them, by showing compassion and love for others. You're showing your love for God. And so that is what Jesus begins to teach his disciples as they continue this journey to the cross. Jesus is with them all the way. Whoever receives one of these children receives him. And when we receive him, we're actually receiving God. 